here we have six is the new four, as I mentioned, a review of the safe prevention uh, of cesarean section. And what I'd like to do is do a brief introduction of Dr. Waldman. Uh, because you can see it's a very extensive one, and he has so much to tell you today, he asked me to cut it a little bit shorter. So what I'd like to just mention is that uh, Dr. Waldman has been past president of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and his commitment to ACOG has been in many different positions. He's also, he was also the immediate past chair of the OBGYN department at St. Joseph's Hospital in Syracuse, and he's advocated for improvements in health and welfare of women for the past 30 years. Uh, he's also established the first hospital-based midwifery practice in central New York, and way back when it wasn't that popular, he was championing father-attended cesarean sections, uh, the birthplace, vaginal birth after cesarean, and the New York State Midwifery Bill, and the right for women to directly access their OBGYN. Since this report has come out, there have been many initiatives to reduce primary cesareans in the United States, and we're very fortunate to have him today to review the guidelines in this report and answer questions that may arise. So we'll move on to the objectives. Maybe we'll, yes, there they are. List there's two reasons why the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine developed the consensus for the safe prevention of primary cesarean delivery. We described the definition and management of abnormally progressing first stage labor, described the definition and management of abnormal second stage labor, and discuss the role of continuous labor support in decreasing primary cesarean births. And without further ado, Dr. Waldman. Hello, everybody. There are uh, a couple of reasons uh, why this topic is important today. We all know that there has been an increased frequency of cesarean sections uh, that is uh, it's stable but still running around 33%. And that failure to progress in labor is a major indication for first cesarean, and today with the uh, feedback rate decreasing, uh, once you prevent the first cesarean section, uh, you're then preventing every cesarean section thereafter, usually. In the old days when we had feedbacks to rely on, uh, we could prevent the first one and uh, have a C-section for the first time, and then end up with a VBAC, and the section rate was quite a bit lower. We're also going to talk about why the Friedman curve has been replaced by what I'll call the Zang curve. And there's also increased public payer and governmental attention to this issue. This is what I was referring to before. You can see uh, when the VBAC rate uh, was uh, higher, the cesarean section rate, the total cesarean section rate went down. But when the VBAC rate plummeted in uh, 1996, the total cesarean section rate went up, and the primary cesarean section rate went up. This uh, graph just shows you that labor arrest accounts for 34% of the uh, primary cesarean sections. We also have had an increasing induction rate. In uh, uh, 2009, uh, the induction rate in the, in the United States was almost 24 percent, and uh, this was a, represented a uh, increase that, of uh, 2.6 times since uh, 1990. In one report out of Delaware, 44 percent of the patients were induced, and 40 percent of those inductions were elective inductions. That was out of almost 8,000 women, a significant number of inductions. And there are hospitals today where the induction rates are very high. This curve comes out of uh, California, and uh, the pink are the indicated inductions, and the blue are the elective inductions. And you can see that some hospitals have a significant number of inductions uh, that are purely elective and some indicated and that other hospitals have a low rate of elective inductions and only in, uh, indicated inductions, and that there's a large variation between that. So 
So hospital practice varies quite a bit from hospital to hospital with respect to inductions of labor. This is a, a curve that comes out of the March of Dimes, which shows that the cesarean section rate has been increasing at every gestational age, and that the induction rate, this is a comparison between 1992 and 2002, has also been increasing between every gestational age. For, for years, uh, the Friedman curve has helped us define labor. Uh, Friedman, uh, it actually, uh, I realized just recently that he did this in his 20s, uh, studied 500 pregnancies, and he created curves uh, that define normal and abnormal labor progression. And he was the first one to depict the labor curve and divide the labor process into stages and phases. In his uh, work, he called abnormal labor progression as 1.2 centimeters per in oliparous women and less than 1.5 centimeters per hour in multiparous women. And I think we all can remember that he said if you don't progress in two hours, that was considered an arrest of labor. These concepts have really come to go govern our labor management. And in fact, uh, it's a mark of quality for Friedman curves to be filled out in maybe many uh, labor units across the country. However, Friedman's curve is probably obsolete, and I'll show you why in a couple of seconds. Uh, these criteria were created 60 years ago and uh, no longer may be applicable to contemporary obstetrical populations and uh, may, not, may not be accurate for current use. The data from the Consortium on Safe Labor was a multi-center retrospective observational study that abstracted detailed labor and delivery information from electronic medical records in 12 clinical centers. Uh, that included 19 hospitals across nine districts of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists from 2002 to 2008. And almost 90% uh, of the births occurred between 2005 and 2007. I've given you the reference to this uh, in uh, the uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, the Green Journal, in this article that was published in 2010, uh, Contemporary Patterns of Spontaneous Labor with Normal Neonatal Outcomes. A total of 62,415 uh, patients in labor were selected. In order to be selected for the study, they had to have a singleton pregnancy, had to be a term, spontaneous onset of labor, uh, vertex presentation, they had to end up with a vaginal delivery and a normal perinatal outcome. And the conclusion of the study was that allowing labor to continue for longer periods before six centimeters of cervical dilatation may reduce the rate of intrapartum and subsequent repeat cesarean sections in the United States. six 
centimeters did multiparous women show a faster labor than nulliparous women. If we look at it uh, in a different way, and looking at the curves from four to six centimeters, nulliparous women and multiparous women dilated at essentially the same rate. According to the study, the active phase of labor does not start until six centimeters of dilatation. So six is actually the new four, because we've always thought that active labor started at four centimeters of dilatation, and uh, we always managed our labors based on the four centimeters of dilatation. But you can see that up until four centimeters of dilatation, uh, the labor curves did not take off up until six thousand years. So why why is Friedman's curve absolute? Or why is there a big difference between Zhang's curve, if you will, and the Friedman curve? Well, for one reason, anesthesia and augmentation are much more common today. Uh, we all know that birth and maternal weights have increased substantially uh, since Friedman uh, started uh, recording his births. There's also significant methodological differences. Friedman plotted the 500 individual curves and then synthesized them into one curve, whereas these uh, uh, researchers used a different methodology. And Friedman curve probably represents an ideal curve rather than an average curve. According to the obstetrical care consensus, and this is a quote, because they are contemporary and robust, it seems that the consortium on safe labor data, rather than the standards proposed by Friedman, should inform evidence-based labor management. In other words, throw Friedman curve away and use these Zang curves in your current labor practice. The consortium on safe labor uh, data did not uh, directly address an optimum duration for the diagnosis of active phase attraction of labor arrest, but does suggest that neither arrest or protraction should be diagnosed before six centimeters of dilatation. Another way of, of looking at it, and this comes from up to date, is that the more dilated you come into labor, the faster you're going to be in labor. So those people that come in at two centimeters uh, will have a very slow labor progress on the whole. And people that come in five are going to go a lot faster. Michel Odant was a naturalist uh, physician who delivered in France. He used to say the best thing you could tell women when they came in in prodromal phase is you don't look like you're in labor. Because he thought that the best thing that you could do was to keep the patients out of labor and delivery until they were four centimeters of dilatation. So uh, in uh, 2012, in November, and again in the Green Journal, uh, this article uh, was published, uh, Preventing the First Cesarean Delivery. And this was a summary of a joint meeting between the uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, the Society for Paternal Fetal Medicine, and DACOM. And this workshop uh, got together to see what, what they could suggest to uh, decrease the cesarean delivery rate. The reason they wanted it to uh, decrease the cesarean delivery rate uh, was uh, uh, had multiple reasons, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. They concluded that labor induction should be performed primarily for medical indications, and if done for non-medical indications, the gestational age should be at least 39 weeks or more, and the cervix should be favorable, especially in the nulliparous patient. The diagnosis of failed induction should only be made after an adequate attempt, an adequate time for normal, latent, and active phases of the first stage, and for the second stage should be allowed as long as the maternal and fetal conditions permit, for as long as the maternal and fetal conditions permit. The adequate time for each of these stages appears to be longer than traditionally estimated. Although cesarean birth can be life-saving for the fetus, the mother, or both in certain cases, the rapid increase in the cesarean birth rates from 1996 to 2011 uh, was done without clear evidence of concomitant decreases in maternal or neonatal morbidity.
morbidity or mortality, and that raises significant concerns that the cesarean delivery is overused. Cesarean delivery is the most commonly performed major uh, surgery in the United States, more than one million surgeries each year. In 2007, 26.5% of low-risk women giving birth for the first time had a cesarean delivery. And a large population study based out of Canada found that the risk of severe paternal morbidities increased threefold for cesarean delivery as compared with vaginal delivery. That was 2.7 as opposed to 0 0.9. The risk of placenta previa and accreta and, and repeat cesarean sections is also becoming a major, uh, major issue uh, with uh, major risk of uh, both hysterectomy and mortality. So although the initial cesarean delivery is associated with some increases in morbidity and mortality, it's also the downstream effects of the uh, number of cesareans and the placenta previous and accretus, which is even greater than the uh, increased risk in future pregnancies from repeat cesarean section. The obstetrical care consensus found that it's a safe prevention of primary cesarean delivery, and again, notes the rapid increase in birth rates from 1996 to 2011. Variation in rates of nulliparous term singleton vertex cesarean births also indicates that clinical practice patterns affect the number of cesarean births performed. In other words, we can have an effect on this. And the most common indications for primary cesarean delivery is labor dystocia. And contemporary labor progresses at a rate substantially slower than what was historically taught. So what are the appropriate definitions of abnormally progressing first stage of labor? These are the recommendations. Uh, that a prolonged latent phase, uh, which is consistent of 20 hours of no interest women, 14 hours in multiple women should not be an indication for a cesarean delivery. That slow but progressive labor in the first stage should not be an indication for a cesarean delivery. That cervical dilatation of six centimeters should be considered the threshold for active phase of most women in labor. Thus, before six centimeters of dilatation is achieved, standards of active phase progress should not be applied. And that cesarean delivery for active phase arrest in the first stage of labor should be reserved for women more than six centimeters of dilatation with ruptured membranes who failed to progress despite four hours of adequate uterine contractions or at least six hours of pitocin administration with inadequate uterine activity and no cervical change. These are obviously much different than what we've been uh, using in the past. With regard to the second stage, the obstetric care consensus, that, that uh, a specific absolute maximum length of time spent in the second stage of labor beyond which all women should undergo operative delivery has not been identified. And before diagnosing the rest of labor in the second stage, if the maternal and fetal, medical, uh, fetal conditions permit, allow for at least two hours of pushing in the multiparous women at least three hours of pushing in no efforts. Longer durations may be appropriate on an individualized basis. In other words, with the use of an epidural anesthesia or a fetal uh, malposition, as long as the progress is being uh, documented. The Schreiber uh, report uh, said that uh, allowing an additional hour in the setting of an epidural, thus at least three hours in multiparous women and four hours in no efforts women, used to diagnose second stage rest as long as the progress is documented. Uh, the consensus did not go that far. So uh, six is the new four. Six uh, centimeters of dilatation is where active phase begins. And at least two is the new one for uh, multiparous. Uh, give multiparous at least two hours, if not three, if they have an epidural. And at least three is the new two. Uh, 
for uh, premier derivatives at least three uh, hours instead of uh, the two hours that we traditionally gave, as long as uh, some progress is being made. And again, as long as the fetal heart and the baby and the mother condition uh, warrants. Six is the new four, at least two is the new one, and at least three is the new two. When it comes to uh, suspected fetal macrosomia, uh, the uh, there is no indication for uh, inducing in a non-pregnant uh, non population. Uh, when in uh, 262 pregnancies where the uh, weights were estimated to be greater than 90 percentile, uh, there was a 57 percent uh, uh, C-section delivery rate in the elective induction group, and uh, only a 31 percent delivery rate in the uh, spontaneous labor group, in other words, spontaneous labor lower cesarean delivery. There was a 5.3% shoulder dystocia rate in the elective uh, induction group, with only a 2.5% shoulder dystocia rate in the spontaneous labor group. Again, uh, spontaneous labor is better for uh, large babies. So uh, their recommendation is that routine induction of labor for macrosomia is not recommended. And uh, furthermore, labor induction prior to term, late preterm birth is associated with increased neonatal uh, uh, morbidity. And that's also uh, consistent with up-to-date because elective induction for larger babies does not reduce the risk of shoulder dystocia. It does double the risk of cesarean delivery. We're, again, we're talking about nine diabetic populations. Cesarean delivery to avoid potential birth trauma should be limited to estimated fetal weights of at least 5,000 grams in the non-diabetic and at least 4,500 grams in women with diabetes. And women should be counseled that estimated fetal weights are imprecise. This is something that ACOG has been saying for years, and this was just repeated in the obstetrical care consensus. The further recommendations were made that the fetal presentation should be assessed and documented after 36 weeks to allow time to uh, perform external cephalic versions, that the perinatal outcome for twin gestation in which twin A is cephalic are not improved by cesarean delivery, and women should be counseled to attempt vaginal birth when the first baby is in first, that amnio infusion for repetitive variable uh, fetal heart Accelerations may safely reduce the rate of cesarean de de deliveries and should be uh, uh, seriously considered. And that scalp stimulation can be used as a means of assessing fetal acid based status when abnormal or intermediate fetal heart patterns are present and as a safe alternative to cesarean delivery in this setting. They also uh, made a statement about operative vaginal. And they said that in the second stage, by some experienced physicians, operative vaginal delivery should be considered a safe, acceptable alternative to cesarean delivery. And uh, training in and ongoing maintenance of practical skills related to operative vaginal delivery should be encouraged. There are some alternate. If you're going to allow women to labor a longer period of time, you might want to consider uh, doulas or uh, supporting doulas because the, the evidence does support the fact that support personnel in labor does decrease the cesarean delivery rate. And the Cochrane study showed it increased patient satisfaction and a, actually a statistically significant reduction in the rate of cesarean delivery. We talk about inductions of labor. Uh, which is really the second part. First part is normal labor progress. The second part really that we want to concentrate on is the normal progress of induced labor. And we can see from this curve that these are the labor curves from uh, 5,388 women. 2,000 were spontaneously labored and 1,700 were augmented and 1,600 were induced. And we can see that spontaneous labor, as you would expect, is much faster with a much higher uh, curve. Uh, that spontaneous labor with uh, uh, nulliparous women is uh, also much faster than induction, and that the induction
reduction of labor curves was significantly slower in both multiparous and uh, nulliparous women. And it's a little surprising in this study, uh, which uh, was done in, in Aaron Coffey's shop, shows that the induction of labor for multiparous and nulliparous women was quite a bit, almost the same curves for, for both of those uh, groups of patients. In this study, nulliparous and multiparous women who undergo induction of labor and reach complete dilation are in labor for a longer period of time than women in spontaneous labor as a result of a slower rate of cervical dilatation between 4 and 6 centimeters. After 6 centimeters, women who are induced in spontaneous labor have similar rates of cervical dilatation. Both nulliparous and multiparous women who are induced can spend over 17 hours in labor after 4 centimeters and still reach full dilatation. Cervical dilatation before 4 centimeters may be even slower in women who are induced, requiring over 8 hours to progress from 3 to 4 centimeters. And the labor progress for women who are augmented with oxytocin closely resembles the induction of labor group or six centimeters, and progress more slowly through labor compared with the spontaneous labor group. So their conclusion is that the latent phase of labor is significantly longer in induced labors compared with spontaneous labor, although in the active phase of labor greater than six centimeters, the curves are similar between the two groups. Rest diagnosis before six centimeters in women undergoing induction of labor should be made with caution. The obstetrical care consensus says that if the maternal and fetal status allows, cesarean deliveries for failed induction of labor in the latent phase can be avoided by allowing longer durations of the latent phase, up to 24 hours or longer requiring that oxytocin be administered for at least 12 to 18 hours after uh, membrane rupture before deeming an a, a induction a failure. This is a strong recommendation with moderate quality evidence. A study of more than 500 women found that extending the minimum period of oxytocin augmentation from active phase arrest from two hours to at least four hours allowed the majority of women who had not progressed at the two-hour mark to give birth vaginally without adversely affecting neonatal outcome. That's a study by Rouse and uh, Howe. And in 2012, Cochrane meta-analysis uh, stated that reduction of labor at 41 and 0 uh, weeks gestation and beyond was associated with a reduction in perinatal mortality when compared with expected management. Therefore, before 41 weeks of gestation, induction of labor generally should be performed based on maternal and fetal medic medic medical indications only, and inductions at 41 and zero weeks of gestation and beyond should be performed to reduce the, the risk of uh, cesarean delivery and the risk of perinatal morbidity and mortality. I'll say that again. No elective inductions before 41 weeks, and inductions at 41 weeks to reduce the risk of cesarean delivery and the risk of perinatal morbidity and mortality. And this was uh, uh, mimicked in the uh, obstetrical care consensus safe prevention of the primary cesarean delivery report based on uh, 1A, strong evidence, uh, strong high recommendation, high quality evidence, that before 41 weeks of gestation, induction of labor should be performed based on maternal and fetal medical indications. Inductions at 41 weeks of gestation and beyond should be performed to reduce the risk of cesarean delivery and the risk of perinatal morbidity and mortality. The key uh, principle in failed induction, and there is no universal standard, uh, is to allow enough time. So failure to generate regular contractions approximately every uh, three minutes and cervical change after at least 24 hours of oxytocin administration. The membrane should be artificially ruptured if safe and feasible. Or in this setting, failed induction can be defined as a failure to generate regular contractions and cervical change with oxytocin administration.
administration for 12 hours after ruptured membranes. Membrane rupture and oxytocin administration, except in rare circumstances, should be considered prerequisites to any definition of failed labor induction. And experts have proposed waiting at least 24 hours in the setting of oxytocin and ruptured membranes before declaring an induction of failure. Some of the reviews uh, that ACOG did when we went across the country with VRQC, uh, the Pitocin would be started in the morning and then about 5 o'clock the cesarean section would be done for failed induction. And I think uh, this document is making a very strong case that that really should, should never happen. Cervical ripening agents should be used when labor is induced in women with an unfavorable cervix. Again, this is based on strong recommendation with moderate quality of evidence. A number of studies have shown that the use of cervical ripening methods, uh, misoprostol, dinoprostol, prostaglandin and E2 gel, Foley bulbs, and laminaria tend to lead to lower cesarean rates and, uh, and, and more successful induction of labor uh, than compared to without using cervical ripening. Uh, we all know that there's somewhat of a controversy with regard to misoprostol, uh, that even though the studies have shown that misoprostol is uh, safe and effective for induction of labor, it is not approved by the FDA for use in pregnancy. And in August 2000, the, the manufacturer of misoprostol warned against its use in pregnancy because of its abortifacient properties and cited reports of maternal and fetal deaths when misoprostol was used to induce labor, fueling the controversy. Misoprostol is used quite significantly across the country, and we're going to use about talk about that a little bit a little bit later. So, um, compared with vaginal prostaglandin, uh, intracervical prostaglandin, oxytocin, vaginal misoprostol was associated with actually less epidural analgesia use, fewer failures to achieve vaginal delivery within 24 hours, and actually more hyperstimulation. So it uh, gets better results, but you have to pay the price with more uterine hyperstim. And compared with vaginal intracervical prostaglandin use, oxytocin augmentation was less commonly needed with misoprostol. But there was also more meconium stained liquid. Uh, so compared to a Foley catheter, which is, uh, I think, increasing in utilization, uh, it's important to note that tachycystole is the main of prostaglandin and cervical ripening agent then it can require removal of drug or even sometimes total lysis. And uh, sometimes uh, we see that the tachycystole is, is a, a reason for medical legal concern because when the, the contractions are more than 18 contractions in 30 minutes, uh, you, you can sometimes get fetal distress. And uh, that should be a, a real concern uh, to avoid so the Foley catheter could be an attractive alternative, and a recent meta-analysis of 1,600 patients comparing the two showed that the uh, time to delivery, the risk of chorionitis, or the risk of cesarean delivery, not actually differ between the two induction methods, but tachycystole, as I mentioned, was nearly three times as common with the use of misoprostol. So maybe a uh, Foley catheter should be considered a little bit more frequently. Cervical ripening lowers the rate of cesarean delivery compared with oxytocin induction alone. Tachycystole, notwithstanding, no method of cervical ripening uh, is clearly superior to any other method. If you develop tachycystole, uh, you should discontinue the uh, misoprostol or oxytocin or prostaglandin. Uh, get the patient in a left lateral uh, position. Administer oxygen. Increase the intravenous fluids, and if there's no prompt response, use either terbutaline or uh, adesabon and uh, or nitroglycerin in, the, in recalcitrant cases. Now, there are uh, some controversy with respect to the impact of induction on cesarean section rates. In a number of studies, uh, and you can see this one where this was the uh, primer gravita induced cesarean section rate was much higher than the uh, spontaneous labor groups and the multiples groups. And in some studies
studies, they show both a higher direct cost per patient, nearly three times more likely to undergo cesarean delivery when cervical ripening agents are used. Uh, for the leprous patient, relative risk of cesarean delivery with elective induction is 2.6 times. And now leprous women undergoing elective induction of labor with low vision scores face almost a 50% risk of cesarean delivery. And I've uh, listed those uh, references for you. So it, uh, my conclusion was, uh, and others, is that labor in induction is significantly associated with a cesarean delivery among oliferous women at term for those with and without medical or obstetrical complications. And reducing the use of elective labor induction may lead to a decreased rate of cesarean delivery for a population. Therefore, elective induction of labor in oliferous should be discouraged. It only should be considering an indicated induction of labor. 41 weeks, as I mentioned before, would be an indication. Um, now, there are other studies that, that have shown recently that the, the problem with this comparison is that they're not looking at uh, apples and apples. And uh, the uh, comparison should, should be uh, that uh, labor induction to uh, expected management awaiting spontaneous labor. And those studies have found either no difference or a decreased risk of cesarean delivery among women who are induced. So when you uh, compare the, the studies in um, induction of labor to the actual alternatives, expected management awaiting spontaneous labor, I found either no difference or a decreased risk of cesarean delivery. And this even appears to be true even with women with an unfavorable cervix. So there is some question about whether inductions of labor uh, do increase the cesarean delivery rate. However, if the inductions of labor are not given enough time, you can certainly assure yourself that the cesarean delivery rate will be increased. Uh, there's been a 26% increase in postpartum hemorrhage due to uh, atony in, in a 12-year period. Um, this is, uh, I think, uh, directly related to uh, increased use of oxytocin. Um, the uh, proportion of induced labors was paralleled by a similar increase in induced labors, uh, according to the article by Lena and Berg, uh, and trends in postpartum hemorrhage in the United States. Uh, in another study, women with severe postpartum hemorrhage, secondary uterine acne, were exposed to significantly more oxytocin during labor compared to match controls. And in another study, a recent multi-center uh, study conducted by MSM Unit Network of the NICHD found that subjects with uterine acne following primary cesarean delivery were exposed to a longer duration of oxytocin compared women with uterine acne. Uh, so therefore, you, there's no question that women who are exposed to more oxytocin seem to have a higher rate of uh, uh, postpartum hemorrhage. And when one is using uh, oxytocin for a long period of time, uh, you should be aware of that risk factor. Uh, we are been making uh, progress uh, with the, uh, this was a recent leapfrog uh, group presentation, and we're talking about the rate of early deliveries. This is something that ACOG and a number of March and Dimes have been working on for a number of years, and you can see that the average rate of early deliveries before 39 weeks has been increasing in the, and decreasing in the United States due to those efforts. So uh, that's a really good thing, and I just wanted to make a note about that, that the uh, rate of induction before 39 weeks has been decreasing, and that's a good thing for uh, women in the United States and babies. Oxytocin and liability, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea of what's out there. Law firms, uh, uh, this is a quote directly from the law firm uh, webpage. Uh, this law firm has represented many families and loved ones have died or been injured as a result of medical practice associated with the use of pitocin oxytocin to induce labor, the injudicious use of uh, excessive doses of pitocin oxytocin can have potentially dire consequences for both uh, mother and baby. So the lawyers know oxytocin very, very well, and they've been using it against uh, doctors for years. Something just happened. I can't change. 
machine in here. Here is a, a list of the, I I gave you just a list of 18, there's probably more, uh, of, of what they say in their briefs. Unnecessary induction of labor due to lack of medical, medical indication, failure to establish fetal well-being, failure to uh, adequately monitor, uh, failure to place a spiral electric, failure to discontinue oxytocin in light of non-reassuring fetal heart rate, uh, failure to stop technical access, and on and on and on. Um, I just wanted to give you an idea of how these uh, Pitocin can be used against you in the court of law. So uh, I suggest that you use a checklist. Here is a checklist for misoprostol uh, that uh, actually appeared in Journal Midwifery in 2003, but it looks like a, a very good uh, suggestion that there should be appropriate indications, that there should be clear definition of patients who should be excluded from use based on ACOG committee opinion that states that misoprostol uh, should not be used with previous cesarean delivery or uterine scars or there are insignificant uh, data to, on the safety in women with multiple gestations or uh, suspected fetal macrosomia, that evidence-based dosing regimens, uh, ACOG committee opinion recommends 25 mics, vaginal misoprostol administered not more frequently than every three to six hours, criteria for repeat misoprostol doses and maximal allowable number of doses, and a minimum four-hour waiting period between the last misoprostol dose and the initiation of oxytocin, if necessary. Continued fetal heart rate and uterine contractility monitoring, management options for hyperstim, creating criteria for physician consultation and referral, uh, documentation of informed consent, and use of a standard approach to build preparation. This uh, pre-oxytocin checklist comes out of the Hospital Corporation of America, who's done a lot of work with this, and uh, Steve Clark uh, uh, is the author of the article. Uh, but they, this is uh, requires they require a physician or midwife order on the chart before pitocin is started, current H and P on the chart, prenatal record on the chart, the indication for the induction is documented, uh, pelvic adequacy uh, is documented, estimated fetal weight has to be current. Gestational age has to be documented, consent signed. A physician with C-section privileges is aware of the induction readily available, and this is documented in the, in the medical record. And the status of the cervix is assessed and documented. Presentation is assessed and documented. This is only to be used for women with uh, singleton pregnancies. ACOS Choosing Wisely campaign uh, suggests that you should not Schedule elective non-medically indicated inductions of labor between 39 weeks and 41 weeks unless the cervix is deemed favorable. Ideally, labor should start on its own initiative whenever possible. Higher cesarean delivery rates result from inductions of labor when the cervix is unfavorable, and healthcare practitioners should discuss the risks and benefits with their patients before considering inductions of labor without medical. So uh, we're, we've talked about changing the culture of labor and delivery, changing the time frame. Uh, six is the new four. Uh, at least uh, three is the new two. At least two is the new one. Uh, we've talked about avoiding inductions of labor unless uh, medically indicated, and that uh, sometimes medical indication might be 41 weeks and zero days. Uh, we've talked about giving women both the labor and, and uh, also inductions adequate amount of time uh, to uh, labor before uh, considering the labor uh, a failure to progress. And uh, we also uh, uh, have talked about uh, we, we need to change the local culture and attitudes of obstetrical care providers uh, so that we give women more, more time in labor. So uh, I think we're at our 45 minute mark and I'll be happy uh, to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Weldman. That was a lot of material in a very short period of time. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, there, we have some questions uh, for you. Uh, remember that you can ask questions by clicking on that orange box with the white arrow in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Type in your question, press send, and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. And thank you so much for your questions as they come in. Uh, I do have a couple here to start with. Is there a medical 
legal risk for allowing a woman to push for four or more hours? Well, I, I think that um, one has to uh, be a, 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 a aware of the fetal heart and, and the uh, patient's condition when allowing for extended second stages. And it would be a mistake uh, just to assume that you can allow a woman to labor longer uh, or you just close your eyes to the second stage uh, and, and not pay attention. You have to pay attention to the fetal heart rate. And if the fetal heart rate is good, reassuring, that second stage can go on for uh, three, four hours for sure. Uh, but the, the fetal heart or the patient's condition is questionable. That's when you really have to intervene. So it's not a, an absence of management. It actually requires you to be more managing because you also have to look at whether uh, the patient is making progress during that second stage. So if there's absolutely no progress or the, the fetal heart is, is not making uh, you comfortable, uh, there is, uh, you can be sued if uh, anything happens to the patient, uh, either the mother or the baby. So yes, there are some dangers in allow, allowing women to push for a longer period of time, especially in this transition period uh, where we're going from uh, uh, treatment concepts to the Zang Good. Okay, um, here's another one. Uh, what do you think should be the appropriate primary cesarean rate? <laughs> there, no, there's no such animal. Uh, I, it, it depends on your population and, and it depends on your hospital. Uh, I mean, we, we went through where uh, outside sources were trying to tell us that the cesarean rate should be 15% or lower. That didn't work very well because we're at a 33 to 34% rate. Um, however, you know, there certainly has to be a reason why one hospital has a 40% or 50% cesarean delivery rate and another hospital can do a 10% cesarean delivery rate. So there really aren't that many differences in the population to account for that, that significant difference. So um, I, would, I think we should look at it more, you know, what can, how can we get, well, how much lower can we go and do it safely? You know, we, could we do it 20% and be safe? Yeah, I think studies show hospitals you can have a 20% section rate and be safe. Um, could we do it medically legally? I don't know. But uh, I think um, we would be best uh, served uh, both in the public uh, and in, in for our, our, our patients if we can get that uh, cesarean leg section rate as low as we possibly could. Thank you. We are significant problem, problems uh, with placenta accretus, percretus, uh, because of the number of repeat cesarean sections that we're doing before uh, today. And uh, those can be significantly life-threatening. Uh, All of the major hospitals, at least on the East Coast, have been noticing an increase in, in those patients. So uh, it becomes more and more important stop that first cesarean delivery uh, from happening. Okay, thank you. Um, how, here's another question. How long does it take for this information to get back into the medical school education and the residency programs? When, how long do you think it will take before there's a, a change in practice? Well, that's why I'm happy to, to present this because uh, just because the article was published doesn't mean that the culture in labor and delivery is going to change uh, across the country. Uh, I think we, we're going to need a number of years of education. Uh, you know, some, some early adopters are going to be out there, but the late adopters could take five or six years. Uh, and so we need to keep talking about it and keep presenting them with the facts and the data, which is uh, pretty strong evidence that this is a, a reasonable approach to labor management. Good. Okay, I have another one. Uh, must be from a childbirth educator. How can we get more expected couples to take childbirth classes to learn about this important information? Or better still, how can we get the care providers to urge their patients to go to classes? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, it's not the, the first time I've been asked that. Um, there's been, a, I think, a decrease in, in classes. And the reason for it so many people are using epidural analgesia in labor, they don't think they need classes. Um, I think the, uh, the only way that you can do it is by couple to couple, just reminding your couples how, how to talk about how valuable 
education uh, was for them during their pregnancies and labors and how valuable uh, the childbirth classes are and to spread the word that way. Um, I think physicians uh, will be the last ones to, to increase the utilization of childbirth education. Uh, so we have to, to uh, swell uh, the ground from below uh, and making sure that uh, women are excited by these new information and the new data that's coming out. Uh, I, I'm hoping that women will start to push the physicians you know, to, to read the documents and read these um, changes uh, in, from Friedman to Zhang uh, and uh, help us move, move this along. Um, the, uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, again, one of the things that I've recognized is that Women who have good experiences are quiet in the back of the room, and women who have horrible experiences are in the front of the room with their hands raised, wanting to tell everybody how awful everything else. Mm -hmm. People in the, in the back of the room to step forward. Yeah. Okay, I think we have one more question. At our hospital, we have almost an 80% induction rate. What should be the first thing we could do to start changing this practice? Yeah, I, I think... Um, if you have an 80% section rate, uh, that's because... Induction rate, I'm sorry. I mean... I'm sorry, a, induction rate. 80% induction rate, uh, that's because they're not reading the statistics. That means you're doing a lot of inductions that are before 39 weeks, I would assume. And I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we need to bring, the, you know, the ACOG document forward and, and, and ask, uh, you know, why are we doing elective inductions before uh, 41 weeks uh, if they're not medically indicated. You know, I think the only thing that you can do is bring bring the facts forward uh, to your physician and challenge them. Bring in okay. speakers. Uh, bring in speakers. Good idea. Oh, I think another question. Is there evidence to support 41 weeks gestation would result in a placenta that is adequate to support for induction and pitocin? Uh, the Cochrane Review is very clear that waiting until 41 weeks is uh, a good idea, but not going much beyond 41 weeks is uh, not a good idea. Uh, I, I actually come from an error, an era of waiting till 43 or 44 weeks, and uh, I practiced in that uh, for many, many years. And as a clinician, uh, over a period of time, even though I was a naturalist, I really came down to not letting women go much beyond 42 weeks. And what happened when I went from uh, 43 and 44 to 42, I stopped seeing meconium and meconium aspiration, which actually almost disappeared in, in my hands. Uh, and so uh, uh, certainly 41 weeks is a, a very adequate uh, amount of time for the placenta to be healthy and to support a, a normal labor. And uh, actually, you know, that's what the Cochrane pro uh, Project shows, and that would uh, what ACOG and MFM uh, group is saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. I think that's probably about it for questions today, and we're just about at the end of our time. I'd like to thank Dr. Waldman for his presentation. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, folks that are on the line that we do have. Uh, uh, an upcoming webinar with Dr. Acker, Revisiting Preeclampsia, the New Guidelines. Uh, that will be Wednesday, September 24th, so please stay on the lookout for that. And uh, I also would like to uh, tell people that the presentation will be posted on the o um, OB Consult website. So should you uh, know that, you know, think that you didn't get everything you should have and you wanted to go back and look at some of the slides at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the website information, and you'll also see contact information for Dr. Waldman and my colleague Maggie Finkelstein and myself. And so on behalf of OB Consult uh, and Dr. Waldman, we thank you for attending today, and we'll look forward to seeing you again in September. Thank you very much, everybody.